So our reading today is from Esther 7.9. Harbonum, one of the eunuchs present with the king, said, What a coincidence. The 75-foot pole Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke up for the well-being of the king, is still standing in Haman's house. Morning, church. Now it's my turn. I got a little bit excited about to cut Josh off there. Let's uh, take just a moment and uh, just stand up and greet one another. Um, try not to venture too far from your seats because we want to get going. But I'll give everybody a chance to stretch. All right, let's start moving our way back. As you're moving your way back, let me go ahead and say welcome. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here and uh, just happy to see uh, so many faces here this morning. Um, one thing to make you aware of as we, uh, um, or a couple things to make you aware of, I guess, as we get started was, I want to echo some of uh, Jacob and, and Carson's thoughts, really appreciate the things Jacob's doing with our youth, and uh, especially appreciate the work that the youth did back here on the pantry. So if you get a chance after church, um, sneak up here, take a look at it. It looks great. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about that. Second off, we are really in need of, of some teachers and uh, could really use people to step up and volunteer for that. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that as well and ask that you uh, prayerfully consider that and, and hopefully be able to help, help us out with that. See Carson, see me, and, and we'll, we'll get you started working. Um, so it's a, a great opportunity to, uh, to serve in God's church is to teach his children about, uh, about God. And so, like I said, be praying for that opportunity. Um, be praying for those who are serving in, in those responsibilities at this time because it, it's, uh, it's a great work uh, to be participating in. And lastly, the thing I want to make you aware of is I'm not going to be here next week. We're going to have a guest speaker. And uh, normally I don't announce who our guest speakers are because I'm afraid you're going to run away because it's somebody like Jacob. Um, <laughs> and so, but this week I'm pretty excited about who's going to preach. And, and so I'll make you aware of who's going to be doing that. Next week you're going to get to listen to Dwayne Syok uh, preach in, in my place. And uh, so I'm actually a little bit nervous about that. You may not want me back, but that's all right. Um, so be, be uh, encouraging to, to Dwayne, as I know you will be, and, and be praying for him as he takes that on. Um, if you want to go and open up to the book of Esther, we're going to be there this morning, book of Esther. And as you're uh, flipping that way, let's, uh, let's go and open up with a prayer together. Our most high and holy Father, we, uh, we come to you now and we are grateful um, for this opportunity that we have to serve you. Uh, we're grateful that we can look around and, and see so many smiling faces that are um, willing and, and ready to serve you. And Father, we pray that uh, in the things that we've done here this morning, that your name has been glorified. Um, Father, we pray that in everything uh, that we do as your body, um, that we are representative of you and that we bring glory to your name. 
that others may, may see you and, and not us, and that others may come to you because of the work that you're doing through us. Uh, Father, we are uh, thankful for this adventure we've been on this year as we've been working our way through the Bible together. We're thankful for um, so many of these Old Testament stories that, uh, uh, that remind us of the way that you have uh, worked through your people through the centuries, and we are grateful that, uh, uh, that you can show us these things. Father, we're thankful for the people who have uh, lived lives that, uh, um, that have been committed to you, and we pray that we can find ways to, to mimic those examples. Uh, we pray this morning that as we dive into your word that you will just uh, push me out of the way and, and have your word, have your will to be seen, Father. Uh, we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're in the book of Esther this morning, and um, I really like this book. It, you know, the book of, of Esther may contain one of the most fascinating stories in all of the Bible. It hits all of the major characteristics that we love to see in a good story. There's love, there's drama, there's scandal, there's suspense and fear and murder, there's irony, there's comedy, there, there's victory, there's characters we love, and there's even characters we hate. This story has all the potential needed to be turned into what would today make for an award-winning movie. And so if you will, if you haven't turned there already, go ahead and open up to Esther. And we're going to spend the majority of our time this morning recreating the story of this great book. And as we travel through this storyline together, we're going to stop to notice a few of the key verses. So, so just start off in Esther chapter 1. We're going to cover it all uh, this morning. There's 10 chapters. They're pretty short. Um, but we're going to look at this story together because I, I just love it. It's a great story. And uh, so we're going to cover this whole storyline together. And then finally, at the very end, we're going to just draw it all together. And I want to make just one very important point that I want us to notice and, and to understand. So uh, we're, we're beginning in, in Esther chapter 1 together. I'm going to be taking all of our uh, scripture readings this morning uh, from the God's Word translation. I don't know if uh, many of you have much experience with that, uh, but I, I really like this translation. It is, uh, I find it to be pretty accurate, but it, it reads uh, really easily as well and helps to really uh, grab the, the, story, uh, the stories in the Bible really well. And so that's what we're using this morning. That's what, uh, uh, what Josh read out of this morning. That's what we'll continue to read uh, from as we go about this. So in this story, in chapter 1, we are introduced to this king and queen of Persia. And the king's name, depending on what version you're reading from, is Ahasuerus or Xerxes. For the sake of this sermon, we're going to call him King Xerxes because I have an easier time pronouncing that. His queen is a woman named Vashti. Now, King Xerxes has spent 180 days showing off all of his great wealth to these many important people. And at the end of those 180 days, he holds a seven-day feast for all of these people. And this is what we read of, of the feast in chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. People drank from golden cups. No two cups were alike. The king also provided plenty of royal wine out of his royal gener generosity. The drinking followed this rule, drink as you please. The king had ordered all the waiters in his palace to let, to let everyone do as he pleased. And so here's what's going on. The king and all these important men with him are spending a solid seven days consuming just as much wine as they could possibly imagine. And you can imagine that at the end of these seven days, they're, they're probably not in their clearest of mental states. They're probably not ready to make the wisest of decisions. In the meantime, Queen Vashti is holding a banquet for all the women in another, part of the, uh, in another part of the palace. And on the seventh day of King Xerxes' feast, when he's quite drunk, he sends to have Queen Vashti come and parade in front of all of his dinner guests. But the queen refused. And this made King Xerxes very angry. So angry that he has Queen Vashti deposed. You'll realize as we go throughout this story that King Xerxes is not the, the most upright of people. He, he's not the most moral guy that we're going to meet. And so in chapter 1, what we learn is Queen Vashti is out. Chapter 2 begins the king's search for a new queen. King Xerxes has representatives go all throughout the, his entire kingdom to find the most attractive young virgins. And these women are given these elaborate beauty treatments and then brought before the king that he might choose one of them to be his next queen. 
And in Esther chapter 2 and verse 7, we're introduced to the two main characters of this book, Mordecai and Esther. And this is what it says concerning them. Mordecai had raised Hadassah, also known as Esther, his uncle's daughter because she was an orphan. The young woman was a beautiful figure and was very attractive. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her as his own daughter. And so Esther is brought into the king's palace, and, and she's prepared to go before the king. And as she's going through these preparations, she never reveals to anyone about her nationality. She never reveals to anyone that she's a Jew. Mordecai had ordered her to keep this a secret. And finally, it's Esther's turn to go before the king. And this is what we read happened, verse 17 of chapter 2. Now the king loved Esther more than all the other women and favored her over all the other virgins. So he put the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And so Esther has become this new Persian queen. And soon after Esther becomes queen, we hear of this other kind of side story going on. Mordecai is out and about, and he hears of two of the king's officials that are mad at the king. And they're so mad that they are planning to assassinate the king. And so what happens is Mordecai tells Esther, Esther tells the king, the king goes and confirms it, and because of it, these two officials are killed. And then we read this very important detail in verse 23 of chapter 2. The matter was written up in the king's presence in his official record of daily, uh, of daily events. And so Mordecai's heroism is written down in the king's daily logs. In chapter 3, we are introduced to a new character. This time we're introduced to the, the villain of the story. He's a man named Haman. And Haman is just an absolutely wretched, terrible guy. But he's been promoted. He's been promoted to a position higher than all of the other of the king's officials. Now, what we know of Haman was this. Haman liked Haman. Haman loved Haman. Haman thought very highly of himself, as we're going to see throughout this book. And the, and the king had commanded that everyone should bow down and pay honor to Haman when they were in his presence. But we read in chapter 3 and verse 2 that, that Mordecai would not kneel and bow down to him. You see, Mordecai was a devout Jew, and he knew that it would be wrong to give such honor, to give such worship and adoration to just any human being. Apparently, Mordecai had made it clear that he was a Jew, and, that, and Haman and his officials seemed to understand that, and seemed to understand that this was his reason to refuse to bow. And that's when we read of Haman's uh, plan and the major issue to be overcome in this book. Esther 3, verses 5 and 6 says, When Haman saw that Mordecai did not kneel and bow, and bow to him, Haman was infuriated. Because the king's advisors had informed him about Mordecai's nationality, he thought, he thought it beneath himself to kill only Mordecai. So Haman planned to wipe out Mordecai's people, all the Jews in the entire kingdom of Xerxes. They were all going to be wiped out. Enraged at Mordecai and the Jews, Haman persuaded King Xerxes to issue this official edict that would demand the deaths of all of the Jewish people. And this order was written, it was sealed with the king's signet ring. And when it's sealed with the king's signet ring, you can't do anything more about it. It's set in stone. It couldn't be changed, it couldn't be revoked. And so upon hearing of this edict, Mordecai and all the Jews began to mourn and to fast, and to weep, and to wail. They would all tear their clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. And at this point, Mordecai realizes that there's only one thing left to do. Esther would have to go to the king, beg him for mercy, and appeal to him for her people. We read that in verse, chapter 4, verse 8. She's going to have to go to the king, beg for mercy, and appeal to him for her people. Obviously, this is going to present several issues. The first being that Esther would have to finally announce her nationality to those around her, something Mordecai had been encouraging her not to do. The second and, and probably bigger issue is this. It's that no one can just approach the king whenever they like without his summoning, not even if you're the queen. To do so would risk death. 
If someone approaches the king and he holds out his golden scepter towards that person, then they'll live and they'll be able to approach. But if he doesn't extend the scepter, then that person's going to be put to death. No questions asked. So Esther fears that the latter is going to happen. Maybe even more so because she knows how the previous queen was treated. Remember, Xerxes is not known for his high moral standards. But Mordecai sends this message to Esther in order to get her to push past her fear. He says in chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Do not imagine that just because you are in the king's palace, you will be any safer than the rest of the Jews. The fact is, even if you remain silent now, someone else will help rescue the Jews. But you and your relatives will die. And who knows? You may have gained your royal position for a time like this. Mordecai sends to Esther with this message. This may be the very reason you became queen. You may have become queen in order that you might be able to save your people. And so Esther agreed to risk her life in order to save her people. And after three days of the Jews fasting on Esther's behalf, she presents herself before the king. And Esther chapter 5 verse 2 says, When the king saw Queen Esther standing in the entrance, she won his favor. And so the king held out the golden scepter that was in his hand to Esther. And Esther went up to him and touched the top of the scepter. Esther is, is welcomed by the king, and at this, she goes in and she places her request before him. Her, her request was this, a series of two dinners, one that day and another the next. And, and the, these dinners would include her, they would include the king, and they would include Haman. And the king was happy about this. The king was happy to grant this request. Now you remember, let's, let's look back at Haman again. You remember that Haman is a, a man that thinks very highly of himself. And so he leaves that day and he's, he's feeling really good to be in, invited to a dinner with just the king and the queen. I mean, what better opportunity than that? However, as he's traveling home that day, his joy was turned to rage when he passes Mordecai on the way home. And Mordecai still refuses to acknowledge him, still refuses to bow in his presence. And so Haman goes home and he tells his wife and some of his friends about this problem that he has with Mordecai. And their solution was simple. Their solution was to build a 75-foot-tall pole and ask the king to have Mordecai hung on it. So that's what they do. They start planning for this. They, they start building the, this pole to, to hang Mordecai. And that night, as Haman was setting up that pole, King Xerxes was having some trouble sleeping. And as that's going on, he called for a servant to read from some of the daily records for him. And in Esther chapter 6 and verse 2, it says, The records showed how Mordecai had informed him that Big Than and, and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who guarded the entrance, had plotted a rebellion against King Xerxes. Of all of the king's records that could have been chosen to be read, this happens to be the selection. Upon reading this, King Xerxes came to realize that you know, he had never done anything to, to properly thank Mordecai, to reward Mordecai for what he had done. And as he was trying to figure out what he could do that would, that would properly reward Mordecai, none other than Haman comes to the king in order to ask to be able to hang Mordecai on the pole that he set up. But before he could make his request, King Xerxes speaks first, and he presents this issue to Haman in, in what would turn out to be just this most wonderful and, and ironic turn of events. I, I, I love this part of the story. I just, I think it's quite funny, and, and I, I really can't do justice to it by, by summarizing it, so we're going to read it together. This is how it's recorded in Esther chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. It says, so Haman came in. The king then asked him, what should be done for the man whom the king wishes to reward? And Haman thought to himself, whom would the king wish to reward more than me? Haman's expecting this reward to go to himself, and so he's going to make it something quite spectacular. So Haman told the king, this is what should be done. The servant should bring a royal robe and the king, uh, that the king has worn and a horse that the king has ridden, one that has a royal crest on its head. 
Give the robe and the horse to, the, uh, to one of the king's officials who is noble. Put the robe on the man whom the king wishes to reward and have him ride on the horse in the city square. The king's servants are also to shout ahead of him, this is what is done for the man whom the king wishes to reward. Haman sets up this, this beautiful scenario where he's setting himself out to, to go ride through the city and everyone to bow down and praise Haman for how wonderful he is. It, it's tremendous because of how much Haman loves himself. Then verse 10, the king told Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse as you said. Do this for Mordecai, the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Do not omit anything you have said. How do you think Haman feels at this point? It, it's pretty funny. So Haman took the robe and the horse. He put the robe on Mordecai and had him ride in the city square, shouting ahead of him, this is what is done for the man whom the king wishes to reward. And after that, Mordecai returned to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home. He was in despair and covered his head. There Haman began to relate in detail to his wife Zeresh and to all his friends everything that had happened to him. Then his counselors and his wife Zeresh told him, you are starting to lose power to Mordecai. If Mordecai is of Jewish descent, you will never win out over him. He will certainly lead to your downfall. While they were still speaking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and quickly took Haman to the dinner Esther had prepared. Haman has, Haman has just suffered utter humiliation. But at the very least, he still has this dinner to look forward to. He still has dinner with the king and queen, and, and that's got to stroke his ego a little bit. However, things just continue this ironic downfall for Haman. At dinner, Queen Esther informs King Xerxes of how her people are, have been sentenced to be wiped out. And King Xerxes asks who is responsible for such a thing, as, as to which Esther points out, the very man in their presence. She points out Haman as their vicious enemy, it says. And as King Xerxes walks out to figure out what to do, Haman stays behind to beg for mercy. However, when, Haman, or when King Xerxes returns, Haman's caught in a rather unfortunate, compromising position with the queen. And then irony of all ironies, this is what happens. Esther 7, verses 9 through 10. Harbona, one of the eunuchs present with the king, said, Well, what a coincidence! The 75-foot pole Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke up for the well-being of the king, is still standing at Haman's house. And the king responded, Hang him on it. So servants hung Haman's dead body on the very pole he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king got over his raging anger. It's a great story, but it just keeps getting better. Because we read on in, in chapter 8, it just keeps going. It says, on that same day, King Xerxes gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to Queen Esther. Also, Mordecai came to the king because Esther had told him how Mordecai was related to her. Then the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther put Mordecai in charge of Haman's property. Xerxes is king, Esther is queen, Haman is dead, and Mordecai is now one of the most high-ranking officials in the entire kingdom. All is good. Almost. One problem remains. You'll remember that the area provinces had been commanded to wipe out all of the Jews. This was a, degree, a decree that had been made and set in stone with the king's signet ring. There was no legal way to get out of this. There was no legal way to revoke this. And so now it's Mordecai's turn to come to the rescue of his people. And this is what he did, verses 10 and 11 of chapter 8. Mordecai wrote in King Xerxes' name and sealed the official documents with the king's signet ring. Then he sent them by messenger who rode special horses bred for speed. He wrote that the king had given permission for the Jews in every city to assemble, to defend themselves, to wipe out, to kill, and to destroy every armed force of the people and province that is hostile to them, even women and children, and to seize their goods. And then in Esther chapter 9 and verse 1, we read, On the thirteenth day of Adar, the twelfth month, the king's command and decree were carried out. 
And on that very day, when the enemies of the Jews expected to overpower them, the exact opposite happened. The Jews, are overpo- the Jews overpowered those who hated them. The Jews are saved. And the book ends with this two-day feast that Esther and Mordecai, the new second-in-command under Xerxes, had established. The Jewish people have been saved, and now it's time to celebrate. Like I said, it's one of the most wonderful stories in all of the Bible. It has absolutely everything that you could possibly want in a great story. We've seen love and drama and scandal and suspense and and fear and murder and irony and more irony and comedy and victory. We've seen the characters that we fall in love with and we've seen the characters that we've not really gotten too upset with when they died. There is literally everything you could possibly want in a great Bible story. Or at least almost everything you could want in a great Bible story. You see, for a story that's found in the Bible and is so powerful in its impact, there is something that is shockingly missing from it. And do you know what it is? Not once is God ever mentioned in this entire book. Not once do we see the name of God appear. What? I mean, how is that even possible? How how did that little detail get left out? And as we think about that, we got to wonder, does this fact change our understanding and and our appreciation of the story? Like I said, I have one one thing I want us to notice, one point I want to make, and here it is. Here's what I want us to notice. If we think that simply not mentioning his name, God has somehow been removed from this story, then we are sorely mistaken. While his name isn't mentioned anywhere, his fingerprints are smudged all throughout this story. We can see it everywhere. We might be tempted to think that Esther or or Mordecai is the main character in this story, but but the one thing that is, uh, the one that's doing the most throughout this entire book is God. And we don't have to hear his name mentioned to see his work throughout. Either God is at work throughout this entire story, or there's just a whole lot of unexplainable coincidences. And I don't know about you, but I'm not a big believer in coincidences. I want you to consider just some of these coincidences that one author points out. He said this, Esther happened to be selected as Vashti's successor. Mordecai happened to uncover the plan to assassinate the king. Xerxes happened to have insomnia on the night before Haman planned to kill Mordecai. The selection of royal chronicles read to the king that night happened to contain the report of Mordecai's good deed. And I might add that the 75-foot pole made for Mordecai just happened to be ready for Haman. You see, the truth is, God is at work in this entire story. He orchestrated this entire thing to work out in a way that would save his people and declare his continual love for them. He orchestrated this entire thing in order to remain in that covenant relationship with them, even though his name is never mentioned. Now here's the lone point I want to make off of of what we've noticed here. It's not the only point that can be taken from this story. In fact, there's several points that we could make from this story. But I want to make just one. There are times in our lives when God's name will seem to be plastered all over every page. Times when God's hand is blatantly obvious in everything that we do and everything going on around us. However, there's also going to be times when God's presence is not so obvious. Times when we won't see his name written everywhere. And as a matter of fact, we may even begin to wonder if he's even still there at all. But the truth is this. God is always working in the lives of his people. We just have to be prepared. We just have to prepare ourselves. We just have to train ourselves to look harder sometimes. It may be that the things that we've passed off as coincidence, the things that we've passed off as just something that we were able to do on our own, or maybe just the simple, mundane, everyday occurrences are really the evidence 
of the presence of God in our lives. You see, the book of Esther is extremely relevant to Christians still today. Because amongst other things, it reminds us of this. No matter how difficult it may be to see, God is still sovereignly at work in the lives of his people. We just have to open our eyes and look a little bit closer in order to see him. You see, Harbona may have said it best when he said, what a coincidence. But maybe we could say it better by saying, what a God. What a God we see at work in the lives of his people. And the same God that orchestrated this entire story of the book of Esther is the same God that is orchestrating every step of our lives. He's carrying us through. He has a plan to save his people. He has a plan to continue his covenant relationship with his people. And his plan is put forth in the man, Jesus Christ. His plan is put forth in the grace and the mercy we receive when we bury ourselves in those waters of baptism and come out a new person, made, made new and made whole in Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we want to offer an invitation. That invitation is to put Christ on in baptism and to have that hope of, of that continual covenant love with, with our Father. If we can help you this morning, if you need to put Christ on baptism, maybe you just need prayers, whatever it might be, we ask that you come forward now as we stand and sing.